A few weeks ago, my friend Adam of the Adam and Sit Show, the Madam and Bitch Show, asked me to read a couple of books. These were End Times, Elites, Counter-Elites, and the Path of Political Disintegration by Peter Turchin, and The Fourth Turning is Here, What the Seasons of History Tell Us About How and When This Crisis Will End by Neil Howe. We'll be discussing these books when I go on their show Tuesday, December 19th. So, for those of you who are always bugging me about when I plan on going on next, that's when. Also, for those of you who are always asking, while I love Sitch, I'm A-Team all the way. In fact, I would like to get Adam on my channel for a one-on-one discussion sometime, so please go harass him about that. I haven't started the fourth turning yet, but I did finish End Times, and I'll be talking about that today. This isn't a proper book review, but certain themes in that book did inspire me to write this video, as the book hits several themes that I like to talk about on this channel. Peter Turchin is a complexity scientist who helped develop a field known as cleodynamics a field of study that attempts to systemize history and treat it like a science. Specifically, it aims to make predictions about how, why, and on what timeline civilizations rise and fall. While Turchin and the field of cleodynamics are relatively obscure with the broader public, both did gain some notoriety when Turchin correctly predicted that the United States would experience significant political violence in the 2020s. Funnily enough, I actually read one of Turchin's books, Ultra Society, before he became better known. This, too, was recommended to me by Adam. Cleodynamics posits that there are two main factors driving societal collapse, elite overproduction and popular immiseration. Elite overproduction is an interesting topic, but I won't be talking about it here today. Instead, I want to focus on popular immiseration. Popular immiseration is simply the idea that regular people are experiencing widespread economic hardship. Much of Turchin's thesis about popular immiseration would resonate with the online left as well as portions of the right. He cites, among other things, the famous Gillens and Page Princeton study that we've heard so much about over the last few years. Except, unlike the online left, I can tell that he actually bothered to read it, as he avoids the word oligarchy when talking about it. Oligarchy, as I've said before, isn't used in the study, at least not in the colloquial sense of the word. This is something the online left has yet to figure out. We do have, like, very institutionally cemented parties, but there is a very strong correlation for the most part between what people want and what actually happens in our government. Now, that's not a perfect relationship. Obviously, for one, like I mean, the majority of people I've read studies that say want... the opposite, that we're functionally an oligarchy and that it basically... Ta- I, I'm if, familiar if with the study the you're referring to. You know, you've heard the study, I'm sure. Yes, uh, there, are, there are critiques of its methodology. Oligarchy was a term used by the media to sensationalize the study. And the online left, which is supposedly so skeptical of corporate media, just picked it up uncritically because it validated what they already believed. Turchin, unsurprisingly, attributes much of Trump's rise in popularity and victory in 2016 to popular miseration. Narratively, Turchin uses stories of fictional people, who, while not real, nonetheless share attributes of people you can easily find in the U.S. He uses these to tell personal versions of things like popular miseration. Turchin tells the story of the making of a Trump voter through economic hardship, through a character, ironically enough, named Steve. Steve grew up in upstate New York in a lower middle class family. His father worked as a machinist at a factory that manufactured highway infrastructure products. This job brought in a modest but steady income that allowed Steve's family to maintain their middle class status. Steve's mother didn't work and the family owned their own house and could afford to send Steve's older sister to a local college. Steve himself decided that he was not interested in college. His high school grades were not that stellar. Additionally, when his sister graduated with a degree in liberal arts and sciences, her diploma had no visible effect on the kind of job she was offered or the wage she got. Two years after finishing college, she and her husband moved away to North Carolina where the taxes and the cost of living were lower and where her husband's employment prospects were better. When he returned home, Steve found that Unlike his father's generation, he could not count on holding a steady job. For a while, he worked in construction, but he eventually trained himself as a car mechanic. Although not suited to any managerial role, he's a good worker with his hands, and his skill at fixing cars is valued by his bosses. Despite that, the level of his salary in real terms is much lower than what his father earned. Additionally, he has no job security. Something always happens. The repair shop goes out of business, or it has to downsize the workforce due to a lack of demand, or the owner demands extra work while refusing to pay overtime. First of all, let's just acknowledge what a loser Steve's brother-in-law is. 
Everyone knows that if there aren't career opportunities where you currently live, the right thing to do is not to relocate, but to wallow around in self-pity. Second of all, you probably recognize that story, because it's the exact same populist sob story we've heard a million times. To demonstrate the typical voter that the Democratic Party now appeals to, Turchin invented a character called Catherine, who says the following in response to Turchin's line on popular immiseration. I started to give her my usual spiel about the drivers of social and political instability, but I didn't get beyond the first one, popular immiseration. What immiseration, countered Catherine. Life has never been better than today. She then advised me to read Enlightenment Now, a then just published book by Steven Pinker. She also suggested that I take a look at the graphs on Max Roser's website, Our World in Data. Channeling both, she urged me to rethink my take. Just follow the data. Life, health, prosperity, safety, peace, knowledge, and happiness are on the rise. Global poverty is declining. Child mortality is declining. Violence is declining. Everybody, even the poorest African country, has a smartphone, which contains a level of technology that is miraculous compared to what previous generations had. This is even more ironic, as I'm the sort of person who routinely cites books like Enlightenment Now. I actually haven't read that one, but I've read books very similar to it. They usually rely heavily on statistics about how the world is wealthier and safer now than it's ever been. Those of you who watch this channel are probably familiar with them. Unlike the fictional Catherine, though, I know the limitations of those statistics, and why they don't exactly resonate with most people. Whenever you talk about macro trends, you should include the following caveats. Just because things are headed in a positive direction doesn't mean that progress is inevitable or irreversible. Most of the authors of these books are wise enough to acknowledge this. More importantly, though, positive global trends don't mean much to the individual. Just because societal trends are moving in a positive direction doesn't mean that there is no longer suffering or hardship. These can both be found in every corner of the globe. As welcome as it may be that extreme poverty is falling, or that child labor is at its lowest level ever, that doesn't mean much to someone in the United States who is worried about paying their rent on the first. In one of my most recent videos, I presented the idea of time prices, and that if you look at things through the lens of time prices, you get an idea of just how dramatically cheaper goods and services have gotten. Still, I got the following comment. I must be doing okay, relatively, but everybody I ever hear from online and in real life seems to be one paycheck away from destitution. I don't know where this guy lives, but if he's like most of my regular viewers, it's probably the United States. And I believe him. Turchin echoes a similar sentiment when he writes, Why does it matter that Steve is wealthier than most people in sub-Saharan Africa? He compares himself not to a sorghum farmer in Chad, but to his father. He knows full well that his generation is economically worse off than the generation of his father. Now, I have and will continue to dispute the idea that people like Steve are really worse off than the people who came before them. As I've argued repeatedly on this channel, much of that idea is based off of nostalgia and a misunderstanding of what life was actually like in the past. But none of that is to say that hardship isn't very real for these people. For what it's worth, Turchin doesn't dispute global trends either. In fact, at the end of his book, he both acknowledges and celebrates them. So it's not like he denies them. He just seems to think that they're relatively unimportant to his thesis. So why do I talk about global trends if I agree that they're not terribly relevant to the lived experience of regular people in my own country? Well, for starters, I just think that they're interesting. That alone is a good enough justification to talk about them. Furthermore, my goal on this channel has never been to persuade people, just to share my perspective. If I do win people over to my way of thinking, that's great, but that's not the sort of thing that I have in mind when I make these videos. Still, I think these macro trends are an important repudiation of what certain people peddle to their audience. The online right, the online left, and populists of all sorts offer their solutions to people who have economic resentment. The thing is, these folks don't think that the problems people face are local in nature. They tend to see them as universal. Usually, it's an opposition to liberalism per se, particularly liberal economics. That is to say, global capitalism. Populists don't just make claims of individual suffering. They make sweeping claims about societies, countries, and the world as a whole. And they believe that individual suffering and the broader malaise are inextricably linked. As an example, the idea that capitalism is pushing us in an economic race to the bottom is a very important talking point with populists across the political spectrum. You can't f over your workers so bad that it makes it, that it incentivizes corporations to go to the U.S. over Canada. So you gotta stop your right to work laws. <laughs> and they're right, we do. We, we can't have this race to the bottom garbage. Because guess what? 
Canada's right that, oh, the corporations want to come to the U.S. over Canada because we treat our workers more like shit, and the corporations want to do that so they can make more profit. But guess what? Corporations also want to send more jobs to Bangladesh than they do to the U.S. Because there's even fewer regulations, fewer rules, and lower pay over there. The argument goes that multinational corporations, in an attempt to maximize profit, will seek out the most desperate people who they can pay incredibly low wages and are willing to suffer worse conditions and set up shop there. People in developed countries, meanwhile, either have to accept worse conditions themselves or go without a job. The same economic forces that are driving popular immiseration here are what is responsible for child labor in the developing world. And this is where the macro statistics are important. If it's true that global capitalism is driving human civilization into a race to the bottom, then why is it that global income inequality, extreme poverty, rates of child labor, are getting better, not worse, simultaneously? It's because these people fundamentally misunderstand the nature and effects of capitalism, and macro trends are the best evidence of this. As Scott Linscombe writes at the Dispatch, Beyond the classic anecdote versus data problem that plagues most policy analysis, race to the bottom advocates ignored that labor costs and conditions are only one of many factors that multinational corporations consider when deciding where to locate. Others include infrastructure, local governance, stability, rule of law, etc., tax and regulatory policies, material costs and availability, and the size and quality of the local workforce. Even looking specifically at labor costs, these critics ignored the value that workers provide their employers in exchange for pay. As Johann Norberg explains, the race to the bottom hypothesis got it wrong because it neglected half the cost-benefit analysis. If labor compensation, in the broad sense, including working conditions, were just a gift generously bestowed on workers, it would make economic sense to reduce it as much as possible. But in a competitive labor market, it is compensation for the job that someone is doing, and therefore there is a tight link between pay and productivity. Some workers might be twice as well paid as others, but that does not make them uncompetitive if they are also twice as productive. Competition has many effects, including a race to the top for productivity, which often results in better, safer working conditions and higher compensation. Johann Norberg's new book, The Capitalist Manifesto, is one of my favorite books about human progress. I highly recommend checking it out if you're interested in that sort of thing. If populists are wrong about the nature and effects of capitalism, what are the odds that they're correct about diagnosing problems that people have, much less offering real solutions? I think that macro trends point to just how ignorant these people are. It may not be the most persuasive argument, but it is the truth. Mm.